Hi, so Sophie, um, when most people think about um, authority and leadership, they tend to think about you know, big centralized bodies like the state. Um, but in your work, you think of it slightly differently. Could you tell us a bit about that, please? Yes, I do. So I work a lot on um, well, post-war anarchist thought. And um, in particular, I mean, because anarchism is a very broad church with many different forms of it and I'm particularly interested in pacifist forms I'm particularly interested in those forms that are very community based very grassroots um, very focused around pe uh, people and direct democracy and obviously in when you sort of look at, at these sorts of ideas uh, these notions of leadership and authority you know they, they're quite they um, they take on some new and challenging forms now some people sort of think immediately make the assumption more well, it's anarchism right by definition that means there can be no leader or no no forms of authority um, and in fact no organization in fact most for most people anarchism is just is chaos and it's something to be feared and something to be um something to be avoided but actually the sort of uh, ideas that I look at have a slightly different take and they say that actually there's nothing inherently wrong with leadership in and of itself but there is something wrong when that becomes permanent and that becomes institutionalized um, what is more interesting to these kind of thinkers um, one of the figures I work on for example is an individual called Colin Ward and he wrote a book called Anarchy in Action, and it was very much based on, on how in our everyday lives, in our sort of workplaces, in our communities, in our homes, in our families, in our friendship groups, um, we are constantly busy negotiating or discussing, uh, working out what we're going to do, how we're going to do it. And we don't actually need to appoint some permanent forms of leadership in order to achieve this. Sometimes, you know, sometimes there, there is that presence in some family structures. Uh, they, they cleave to a very particular form of of um, interaction, perhaps as a male head of the family, perhaps a female, but actually in many um, places and circumstances you don't have that. So I think um, the interesting thing for me when I was sort of moving through these ideas and working through them was to get rid of this idea you have to eliminate leadership in this sort of great fraternal cuddly sense of absolutely everyone in agreement it's you you know it's not necessarily you need to get complete consensus on something it can be that there is someone who has a particular strength or a particular understanding a particular insight on something that you want to achieve and then by all means people should listen to them or if there is a sort of natural sense to which they are able to to direct or guide or facilitate something happening then by all means respect that but the big thing is it doesn't become permanent and that when things change and change is possibly the most important factor in this form of anarchy um, and acknowledging change and living with the fact that things change in a meaningful way at some point somebody else is going to be better placed to take that role so that's sort of that's the kind of nuance to leadership that I think these anarchist ideas bring yeah thank you that makes a lot of sense so um in your, in your answer there, you mentioned direct democracy, and obviously, yes. you know, th this has been discussed in the UK before. Um, I think maybe the consensus view is that um, even though the ideal of direct democracy is um, very worthy, it's something I think people would like to embody, um, there's a general consensus that it's sort of unlikely to work on the scale of the United Kingdom, even though it might work at more local levels. Um, could you speak to us about, you know, what, what does the anarchist say to that kind of worry? Mm. A few interesting um, um, points there, but yes, absolutely. It's generally, it's not just that it's sort of laudable but unrealistic. Some people actually very much don't feel it's, it's laudable at all. Some people um, sort of think it's veering, veering towards kind of more dangerous forms of populism and you can't deny that it does have that within the tradition there are certain voluntary groups that have existed in history um, that are spontaneous and cooperative and, and, and work for very very questionable or, or frightening things and we are to some degree seeing things like that and that's something that you know I certainly feel that I need to address and confront and not evade um, the other big um, sort of stereotype that goes with it is that if it's direct democracy, then you're going to be having lentils for lunch, there's going to be a drum circle, and at some point the incense is going to be lit. Um, and I'd avoid the brownies if I were you. <laughs> yep, that's in there too. That, I mean, most stereotypes kind of have sufficient grains of truth in order to keep them perpetuating. 
And these are sort of factors that do put people off. I think a lot of people don't realise the extent to which they're already practising direct democracy and just not realising it. Like I said in my um, previous, uh, previous response on the question of leadership, so many times if you are capable of being within a group of friends and organising something or deciding on something, then you're actually capable. Like the, the raw skills and processes and mechanics of that um, you've got them, they're in there. So it's not, so I sort of push back on the, on, the, on the notion that it's impossible. Human beings living together and trying to work that out is a, 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 in essence what we're talking about here. Now you also mentioned in the question sort of, okay, but how would this work on a United Kingdom scale? And indeed, you know, how would you work that on a kind of global scale? We, are, we have to sort of look at the issue. These direct democracy communities, such as might have been envisaged by someone like Jean-Jacques Rousseau, for example. Even he, back in the sort of 18th century, said, well, it's too late now. Modern society, modern industrial society is too complex. We can't go back to nice little cosy peasant communes, um, no matter how hard we try. <laughs> um, and part of me is attracted to the cosy little peasant commune, apart from the fact that, you know, having grown up in a very rural part of part of Britain um, and the idea of being enclosed in that community, it's <laughs> not all Candleford people. That's all I'm going to say. Um, so yeah, interesting notion. Now the sort of anarchism I'm committed to, I could speak to you about federated communities or, you know, so, and, and the, the fact that far from being anachronistic, you know, these sorts of models of federation. So for example, you've got Kropotkin's notion of federated communities, slightly updated by I think of GDH Cole in the mid in the mid century. He talked about guild socialism and those sorts of notions. How you organise sort of a complex modern industrial society by through sort of syndicates or workers' control. There are all those models out there, and they're useful to be able to sort of present. The sort of anarchism I um, that interests me the most doesn't really like to kind of paint ideal social orders. For me, it's always far more of a of a practice, and in this in this sense, I sort of cheat a little bit. So I say, well, I don't need to worry about how you would necessarily organise or institutionalise direct democracy. Direct, direct democracy that sort of implies that that's it's direct democracy is sort of a means to an an end, right. like the end being you know this perfect social order where everything's jolly and lovely and equal and just and all those good things. Now that would be nice, but actually I sort of come in slightly differently and say, well, for me, direct democracy is kind of the end and the means all in one. So if I can see any opportunity in any space, existing spaces and, cre and, and new ones, you know, but uh, it's perfectly possible within existing spaces where people can just increase the amount of democratic practices that are available to them with existing means. Now that to me is a, is a possibly more interesting interesting angle, although it does feel to some people like I'm evading the question of how it might work on a large scale, but I sort of think I don't, I would, I would fall into paradox very, very quickly if I start dictating to you how to be free, right? right. We all know right. you can't be forced to be free. Right. But what I could do instead is ask, well, in any given situation, how might you increase the amount of freedom that's available to you? And that would be a good start. Yeah, so, so it's about um, taking the practices and some of the skills and the activities that we're already engaged in. Because the whole thing about direct democracy, if it's not voluntary and spontaneous, then it's not direct democracy. So if you invent a new system and say to everyone, this is going to work, you have to do it like this now, uh, that's actually very, um, l it's a logical fallacy. It, sort of, it collapses in on itself immediately. Uh, you have to start where people are actually at, with what they're doing, with where they already are, and respecting them as, as already thinking and intelligent beings that, that are capable of making decisions, are capable of cooperating, may not want to do it in the pattern or to the order that you've got in mind. Mm. And that doesn't, mean, that doesn't mean you tolerate anything. Of course, it's an exchange, it's a discussion. Democracy is that. It's not for me, democracy is not about achieving a complete consensus and that's the only means by which it can function. Right, 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 right. It's actually about how you have conflict that's creative rather than catastrophic. Good. So, so I wanted to bring you back to the worry that you mentioned, was, which is that there are um, some instances of the past and unfortunately maybe in the future as well of 
people using these kinds of methods but coming to form groups that have ideologies or moral views which we now find to be generally sort of abhorrent. Um, and I guess the question I have is, how are we to, you know, without sort of disturbing the democratic nature of this process, how are we to nudge our way off that path? So for example, I think when you nodded your head to it, the, um, the, the new Italian leader is yeah you know, f further right than maybe some people were hoping across Europe. Um, and there are those sentiments, um, and I think they need to be taken seriously as a matter of democratic practice, Absolutely. right? This is an embodiment of what the people of Italy wanted. Um, but, you know, I for one am concerned, and I, I get the sense many other people yeah. too. So how, how are we gonna use this direct democratic procedure to nudge away from some results? Um, yeah. For me, so I think you're you're going somewhere that's sort of really interesting here because and um, the difference maybe in the first instance between liberal democracy as a noun for a set of institutions and a historical formation, a socio-political formation um, that sort of takes acknowledges or takes its cues from from particular ideas of ancient Greece or the ancient. Um, Greek world, for example, and that has had the majority of its concentrated development in the West and in America and places like that, and, and now finds itself facing a lot of questions and, and challenges. And then there is a certain degree of irony to which, in order to protect itself, this liberal democracy, capital L, capital D, proper noun, has to actually kind of to what extent does it feel that it needs to abandon um, democracy as an adjective or a verb for a certain way of practicing and being and, and sort of deliberating on decisions, which is what we're essentially talking about when we talk meaningfully about democracy. And it's tricky. One of the, so my first port of call with this, the, the, the great wave of populism as it's being referred to. First of all, I, th I think it's difficult to think about it that way and get any and get much further along along the tracks the leader i mean the and it's something the political right has always been remarkably good at and the political left has always been remarkably bad at the political right have an ear to the ground more than people realize and they are very good at picking up perfectly th concerns or fears or worries that are not in them in and of themselves completely unreasonable and turning them into a very well-crafted rhetorical and political campaign. Uh, Margaret Thatcher was, you know, she's uh, someone I used to work on quite carefully was the, the historian Raphael Samuel. And he once said, uh, Margaret Thatcher stole the left libertarians' best lines and used them, <laughs> and used them for, for the right. She understood what people were objecting to and played that to her advantage. A lot of these movements are simply recognizing that many people feel very anxious, worried. They are conscious that they're living in systems that don't seem to be working, that there's a, a disjunction or um, distortion between what they are being told should be the case and what they are actually experiencing in their lives. Again, if you sort of drill in and start trying to avoid sort of mass or mob thinking when it comes to populism, you'll have a tiny small minority of people who are hardcore committed to these views and a larger group of people who don't f are not finding any other forms of expression or representation anywhere else. And they are being welcomed and they're being given dignity and respect by these sort of these other sort of sources of power. So they're gravitating towards them. I'm not sure, like, so in my ideal, um, having more democracy right now, democracy, the adjective, the verb, would be the best way of protecting the liberal democracy proper noun as a system. Um, that would be what I would, would advocate that we have come so far away from a culture where we are willing to listen to people's fears or concerns, especially when they check or go or run counter to what we want to hear. And so that's for me, that's, that's an important starting place. But it's a frightening one because obviously it takes time, it takes mm. time to win that respect and create those uh, cultures of discussion. 
and we are living at times where uh, we don't know how much time we have for certain things. Yeah, I mean that. I think that's that sounds right. And the the insight that the right has been better at listening to concerns that people have and turning them into a political campaign that mm. rings very true. And, I and mean, we saw in that Britain, in 2016. Yeah, didn't yeah we? exactly, exactly. So obviously Thatcher, but um, it's happening right now. It it's is. happening. It's happening as we speak uh, in the cabinet office. <laughs> um, so uh, I thought we could turn to some biographical questions. Um, so you've spoken in the past about your sort of libertarian beginnings, and I wondered if you could, <laughs> if you could give us a sort of potted history of how you came to this interest in anarchism and how you came to these views. Mm. So I was definitely an anarchist before I knew I was an anarchist. <laughs> um, my mum was a teacher, and she uh, she made the cardinal error of teaching both my brother and I to read when we were very, very little, before we started school, and saying to us, if you can read, the world's open to you, you won't, you know, you won't need anything else. Oh, she should not have said that. <laughs> um, I tried school and found that I didn't like, like instinctively I reacted against the regiment, the regimented nature of the day, the fact that I was enclosed, the fact I was told what to read, when to read, how to read it. Before I even had anything resembling a sort of critical or an analytical language for these things, it was just, and I think this is probably the case for many people, it's an instinctive gut reaction. And I had a few choices. Um, I could do what many of my peers did and sort of, it was the uh, prototype of quiet quitting. So you mm. just go there and mm. you just get through the day mm. and you just wait for break time, lunch time, and home time. Those are the three highlights of the day. <laughs> or another group that just um, kind of sort of uh, disrupted their own lives by by basically rebelling, re being um, uh, sort of badly behaved, what have you. I decided to take a third option, and that was simply I just walked away. I I, I continued to um, reject or refuse. It was uh, yes, it was my first example of resistance, I suppose, and. Uh, I was very lucky. I had understanding parents, and here's the here's where the direct democracy came in. They were both of them willing to hear my point of view, even as a child. And the the point you can, I was always told, you you can make your case. You're going to receive criticisms on it, but you must if you can make your case, if you put your point across, we will listen. That was the deal. No guarantees and agreement, but certainly I got a hearing. And so one way or another, somehow I managed to sort of bumble, struggle through so many, the, the, you know, 18 years. I, I took the exams fairly independently. So I had a very in and out, very checkered, very minimal relationship with formal education. And now I come to look back and I think that that was sort of extremely important. From a very young age, I got very used to being very self-reliant from deciding what I was going to read, how I was going to learn. If I had been forced through school, I think my passion and enthusiasm for all that sort of thing would have been completely extinguished, pretty much annihilated by the time I got to 18. Um, the fact that I was choosing what to pursue and how, and in that process found that things that I wouldn't normally have wanted to do, like mathematics or science, they, they weren't sort of natural things for me. But through needing to know, wanting to know about certain things, I sort of quite organically found myself just being interested in everything and seeing the value and the, and, and the potential value of, of everything. So that, in a very uh, everyday, boring, non-exciting way, um, was the roots of it. And that's why I suppose when I come across, across radicalism, capital R, glamorous, chic, you know, sort of um, with all your sort of factions and groups and that, that's that's not that's not the sort of culture that um, that I kind of gravitate towards. There, it is strongly sort of individualist in my case, but never sort of in the isolated individual. It's my way of constantly moving through the world and being a part of the relationships and the interactions that I'm in, rather than simply going along with anyone else's other pattern of life. That leads me to my final question. So I wanted to ask, and in fact, there might actually be two questions here now. So um, obviously, I'm sure there are lots of thinkers that you would have liked to meet that you never had the chance. Um, so I, I was going to ask, um, what sort of historical anarchist figure would you 
like to have a sort of lively dinner conversation with mm -hmm. and what would you choose to speak about? But perhaps there are two questions in the sense that maybe one answer for a younger version of yourself, you know, who was experiencing this passion for certain projects and certain things, finding school education mm -hmm. stifling. And then now someone who's embraced this knowingly, you know, mm -hmm. self-knowledge of what you are and how it fits with anarchism and where you fit in in the anarchist community. Well, um, so my younger self, one, once I got to the point where I realized that there could actually be sort of politicized ways of talking about how I was feeling and going towards those early kind of that classic George Woodcock history of anarchism, which uh, sort of, I, I, I don't think any, any student could have got through the 60s without having a copy. Of that. I would hope not. But that was actually really important. And that book is, I mean, it, within the anarchist canon, it does the useful job of setting out the ancestors. So it's got Kropotkin in there and it's got Bakken in and it's got Proudhon and it's got Tolstoy. And you know, it's, it's not compulsory to come from Russia and have a great beard <laughs> if you're an anarchist, but it helps. Uh -huh. And I suppose for me, any figure from that book, I was a bit disappointed that there weren't too many sort of really interesting sort of female figures. Um, Emma Goldman is obviously a sort of interest, but, but I suppose when I was younger, that was quite important to have this sort of sense of a, a deep, a deep history um, and these quite glamorous, exciting figures with their sort of big ideas and mutual aid. And I, so I suppose if I was to narrow it down, when I was younger, I think I, it, it, was, it would have to be Kropotkin sort of thing. But now actually, in the sort of work I do, I, I do a lot of work through intellectual biography because to me, it's a really useful way of showing how the individual is never an isolated, private, separate entity. That actually, if you look at biography, if we tell the story of our lives, we can't do that without showing all the social relationships and interactions that go into to forming any one life. And so the thinkers I look at now um, are really interesting from that respect. So Colin Ward, for example, Raphael Samuel, E.P. Thompson. Um, and at the moment, I'm doing a lot of work on figures like who you wouldn't even, and who would never have called themselves anarchists, people like G.D.H. Cole or Isaiah Berlin. Now, before I'm, I, I'm not, but I'm not saying for one moment that they were anarchists. But what's really interesting about what these people are trying to do is what I'm trying to do. It's work out how to be politically committed without having to have all the answers, and work out how actually democracy. The conditions for democracy as a concept are satisfied by practice. You don't always have to have the finished result to say that you are, um, you, you are experiencing radical democracy. Brilliant. Thank you very much. I think we might wrap up there. Perfect. Thank you for coming. My pleasure.